So we're here uh, to talk about fact-checking. Um, my name's Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of science journalism at New York University. And uh, it's a very timely topic. Suddenly, everyone is talking about facts. In fact, they're not really talking about facts. They're, they're raging about facts. Uh, not just scientists and science journalists. Everyone's talking about what a fact is. And of course, we know who and what to thank for this. Donald Trump, Brexit, Vladimir Putin, and the increasing ubiquity of, of bogus, easily shared information on the web. So journalists have responded to this, as you all know, by being much more aggressive in calling out lies from politicians. Those politicians, meanwhile, have tried to deflect the critical coverage by labeling any news they don't like as fake news. So if you've been around a while, you know that there's nothing fundamentally new about this. But I think most of us would agree that the intensity of it is unprecedented. We've just heard more about this than ever, at least in my lifetime. And thanks to these uh, fake news wars, the process of identifying what is fact and what isn't is suddenly at the very red hot center of the political conversation, not just at the periphery where it customarily is. So as we'll learn this morning, fact checking initiatives are on the rise at news organizations around the world. They're proving to be popular with readers, uh, at least some of them. But there's no consensus on how convincing the evidence needs to be before a piece of information can be labeled as a fact or a falsehood. And that's where we science journalists can be so helpful because the scientific method is still the best tool around to assess the weight of the evidence. In fact, the new interest in fact-checking presents some interesting new opportunities, even GASP employment opportunities for science journalists, either on staff or as freelancers. So this morning, we're going to hear from four veteran journalists who are raising the standards for fact-checking, finding better ways to present fact-checked material on digital platforms, and evangelizing for better fact-checking processes in every corner of the newsroom, not just the science desk. So uh, they're each going to speak for 10 minutes, and uh, that should leave us uh, plenty of time for questions. So we'll, there are a couple of mic stands set up, or at least one mic stand here in the middle, and that's where we'll do questions. But first, uh, we're, we're going to we're going to have the four presentations, and it makes sense to begin with uh, Brooke Burrell. Brooke uh, has written on everything from particle physics to the seedy world of cannabis pesticides to the rise of the bed bug for the likes of Popular Science, Na Nature, Guardian, Atlantic, BuzzFeed News, 538, Undark, a lot, lot of other places too. She's gotten grants from the Alicia Patterson Foundation, the Sloan Foundation. She teaches writing workshops at the Brooklyn Brainery and at uh, New York University, which I hear is a pretty good place. And her books are the uh, critically acclaimed Infested, How the Bed Bug Infiltrated Our Bedrooms and Took Over the World, and most relevantly for today, The Chicago Guide to Fact-Checking, which Library Journal named one of the best reference books of 2006. So she literally wrote the book on this, so let's begin with Brooke. Here's Brooke Burrell. Hi. It was actually 2016, not 2006. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. I was like, wow, that book's been out for a while. Actually, I had the interesting experience with that book. It can't, we intended that book to be the Chicago Guide to Fact Checking to be a book for journalism students and freelancers and newsrooms, but it came out a month before the 2016 election in a very interesting environment for facts and alternative facts and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, it's been an interesting year for me. Uh, so I've been tasked today with sort of uh, giving an overview of what fact-checking is, what we're actually talking about today. I wanted to start that by differentiating between editorial fact-checking, which is what my book is about, and political fact-checking, which is probably the sort of buzzword of fact-checking that we've heard in recent years. Um, a lot of what I'm drawing from when I'm talking about this today, I, I wrote the book and a lot of it drew from my own experiences, but I also interviewed around 90 other journalists and fact checkers and research heads at 
magazines like The New Yorker and Vanity Fair and places like that to sort of pull these experiences together into the book. This, this style of fact checking is, of course, every journalist knows how to do research and check their facts. It's something that you do learn, of course, in journalism school, but this process of editorial fact checking is usually only something you learn if you get a job as a fact checker or if you get an internship at a magazine where they actually do this kind of work. So that's what the book is about and that's sort of what I'm gonna be drawing from today. So just briefly, I think of editorial fact checking as quality control before publication. So this is something that's happening in-house, uh, usually in a magazine. This has sort of traditionally come up in magazines. Uh, it's been around for decades, especially in magazines like The New Yorker and National Geographic, although of course now many other magazines also employ this. Uh, it's not as common in daily newspapers and nightly news and that sort of stuff, not because they don't care about facts, but because they don't have the time to do this style of fact checking uh, because they have a much faster paced newsroom. But when I, when I say in-house, so this is something that happens in-house and I say third party, meaning it's a person who is not involved in putting the story together. It's not the journalist, it's not the editor, it's someone else. Ideally, the idea is that this is someone who is not uh, emotionally sort of invested in the piece. They aren't the one that put the narrative together, they're not the one that chose all the original sources. It's someone who can kind of kick the wheels and make sure everything is uh, solid. Um, I already said this, primarily found in magazine newsrooms, although in my book I, I realized in talking to people, you're finding this style of fact checking more and more in a radio shows like places like This American Life and Radio Lab. Somewhat with book authors, books aren't typically fact checked, but book authors do sometimes hire fact checkers for this kind of work and so on and so forth. So the fact checker is going to be fact checking individual facts like names and statistics and those kinds of individual uh, things like that. They're also though looking at big truths. So I'm sure we've all read a story at some point in our career as a journalist or just as a reader where all the facts in a story were accurate if you looked them up, but the whole story didn't ring true because there was something else missing, there was something weird in how those facts were put together. So the fact checker is ideally also reading for those big truths and making sure the story is sound. Uh, and also errors of omission, which is one of the hardest things I think to check for because you don't know what you don't know. So it's a matter of not just reading the story or fact checking, but reading a lot outside of that and trying to make sure the story is not missing anything important. So just briefly, even though I'm not gonna be talking about this necessarily, a lot of the fact checking we're talking about today though is going to be this sort of style of political fact checking but applied to science. I think of this as a watchdog after publication. Uh, so this is gonna be a third party who's external to the process of how that publication or speech was made. The example in, politi uh, in politics would be PolitiFact or factcheck.org, fact which is really hard to say. And they're fact checking things like political speeches and campaign promises and media appearances and so on and so forth, usually from politicians, sometimes doing this live, sometimes doing this after the fact and having some sort of scoring on how factual the, the, whatever it was actually was. So back to editorial fact checking. Why do we fact check? This is, should be obvious, but nonfiction should be nonfiction. If we're writing something that's nonfiction and as a book author or a piece of journalism, we have it sort of nonverbal contract with the reader that we are doing something to, for them. We're writing something for them that is true. Uh, reputation as a writer, journalist, and publication. We're only, our reputation is only as good as the work we're doing. And then more broadly, even though I know no one really likes to think of the, or talk about media as this sort of monolithic, the news media, but every time one of us gets something wrong, it sort of chips away at that credibility of the entire ecosystem of the news. It makes it that much easier for someone to say the news doesn't get anything right. Um, I can't talk a lot about this because I don't have time, but I'm happy to talk about this during the Q&A. Inaccurate news stories help this sort of fake news thrive. If we have mistakes in our stories, it just makes it easier uh, for those stories to get out there and spread. And then just on a practical level, I'm not a lawyer, so I am not going to get into this too much. If you have any questions about legal issues, you should talk to a media attorney, but fact checking can help prevent, uh, you know, mistakes that could lead to defamation lawsuits, invasion of privacy, and so forth, and then other ethical issues that aren't necessarily legal issues, but things like plagiarism, a fact checker, hopefully could catch this before something goes to publication and save everyone a lot of embarrassment. So what to fact check? I mean, this is just a short list of things you might be fact checking at some point in your career. Um, I'm not gonna read all these obviously, but really it's everything. A fact is just something that you can go back, drill back into the primary source, find multiple primary sources, and, and figure out, yes, this we have good documentation that this is true. The last few I just wanna point out, even if it's not on the list, especially the things that you think you know are true, that's when you make the most mistakes, when you just assume, I don't need to check that, and move on. Always check them. 
Uh, we can get into details of how to fact check certain things if you want, but this is just the basic outline of how it would work in a magazine, just to give you an idea if you have not been in that world before. Usually, not always, this is ideal by the way, this doesn't always happen, but the writer ideally provides a document, uh, their near final story to a fact checker. They're gonna annotate it, whether it's making uh, comments or footnotes uh, and give all of their backup material. So that means every single sentence, every single paragraph is going to be highlighted and they're going to say, I got this from this person's interview, here's their contact information, here's where you can find the quotes in my, you know, audio files, whatever. The fact checker is going to go through, check those in individual facts and sort of big story against the backup material. They're going to assess the backup material. I, as a fact checker, have gotten an annotated story from a, a writer that um, annotated it with Wikipedia links which is not helpful. Uh, I too know Wikipedia. You should be uh, annotating with actually primary sources and stuff. So the fact checker is looking and making sure that backup material is actually good. And, and then they provide a report for the editor and the writer. Sometimes they're working directly with the editor, sometimes directly with the writer, sometimes both, and, and going through their proposed changes. Now the actual <laughs> mechanics of how that works is actually kind of, there's a lot of diplomacy involved and a lot of uh, navigating some tricky relationships. We can talk about that later if you want, but it can be, it's I, I always say that being a good researcher is incredibly important for being a fact checker, but also being really good at interpersonal relationships and, you know, uh, sort of sweet talking people to get your facts, you know, checked into the story. Like that's that's a big part of the job. Um, I stole this from Michelle Nyhaus. I love this. I'm not going to get into sourcing too much because I don't have time. I have an entire other talk on that. But no matter what the source following something like this, cut this out, there's a convenient uh, scissor on here, so you can, <laughs> there's a dotted line, you can cut it out, put it by your desk, who is telling me this? How does he or she know this? Given one and two, is it possible that she or he is wrong? If the answer to three is yes, find another unrelated source. Repeat until answer to three is pretty effing unlikely. And until process is complete, assume bullshit. I think it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good outline on how to find a good source. Fact checking on a budget, I added this in here just because I know there are a lot of people in the audience who aren't necessarily at a magazine that has the resources to have this really intensive process with a third party fact checking every single thing. It's very time consuming uh, and it's expensive. So if you are at a magazine that doesn't have fact checkers, if you're at a digital publication, if you're a blogger and trying to fact check your own stuff, uh, it can be kind of risky to do th it this way, but th these are some tips on how to do that. So. Um, prioritizing potential liabilities. If you are making huge claims in the story and it's stuff that if you get it wrong, you're opening yourself to a lawsuit, you wanna make sure you definitely have the backup materials that prove that you are telling the truth. Um, this is silly, but it's it, the easiest facts to mess up are sometimes the easiest ones to find, like Googling someone's name and making sure you're spelling it correctly and things like that, making sure uh, references to geographical locations and stuff that are very easy to find on Google Maps. Looking at that stuff, it's relatively easy and fast. Uh, relying less on people, uh, looking to their official websites or original research and stuff like that rather than having to call everyone up and recheck things with them. Uh, using multiple secondary, this is not ideal, but some magazines actually do this, using uh, multiple reliable second secondary sources instead of primary. And this is also a fun trick, I mean, reading it with fresh eyes, I, it's hard sometimes to build this into your deadline, but making sure that you have some time to step away from the computer, even if it's just five minutes walking around and getting coffee, coming back and changing the font, printing it out, on, you know, and actually reading it on paper instead of on your computer, going to a different room and reading it, and reading it as though you are not the one who wrote it. It's very difficult to do that. Reading it from the perspective of your biggest critic. Uh, one of my friends calls this plugging the troll holes, which is something I've stolen and I think is great. Seeing what those commenters are going to pick on and trying to plug those up and make sure, they might not be right, but making sure you're covering all your bases and preemptively uh, filling in the facts and information that you need to support that. Final thoughts, the facts may be objective, but the truth isn't always objective. I know that sounds kind of strange, but like I said, sometimes you read a story where the facts are all perfect, but the overall sort of angle just doesn't feel right. So just making sure that you understand those sort of differences and consider that when you're writing. Bias is inevitable, we are all biased, but making sure that you are fair, whether you're reporting or working as a fact checker. I'm um, consuming broad media diets for all of us just to make sure you can calibrate that bias detector, reading things from across the political spectrum, for example. Sometimes not everyone agrees on the facts. It can be sort of a delicate process to figure those out. So, you know, you won't win every battle. Pick the fights wisely and make sure you're fighting for the one, the, the facts and information that are really going to put you at risk or put the magazine at risk or just harm readers in some way. You'll make mistakes and it will be okay. 
probably, but maybe don't. And that's it, there's my contact information. So Brooke, that was wonderful. Uh, Brooke really focused on, on the first category. Uh, uh, our next three speakers will be talking more about political uh, fact-checking, as, as Brooke called it, and, and we'll have sort of three case studies about how journalists uh, in practice use what uh, Hemingway called the, the, the built-in bullshit detector that every, every reporter needs. Uh, our next speaker is Gary Degorn. He's at Le Mans, the French newspaper. He contributes to the online column Les Codures, the C Decoders, and he specializes in fact-checking and data journalism. He studied computer science and journalism uh, as an undergrad, and he worked for West France, the largest French newspaper, uh, and also for Novethic, which is a website specializing in climate-related issues, before he joined Le Mans in 2015. He covers general news and especially science stories, mainly climate science, environmental issues, and astrophysics. So Gary, take it away. Thank you. So my name is Gary. I'm a journalist at Le Monde in Paris. Um, I'm a member of Les Decoders, the Decoders, which is an online column uh, which is specialized in fact-checking and data journalism. Uh, and today I'll talk about what we do and how science stories are taking a, a greater place in what we write in our job. Um, at the very beginning, the decoder started as a blog. In November 2009, Nabil Wakim, who is a uh, senior journalist in the web newsroom, uh, created this blog. Uh, it was one of the earliest fact-checking initiatives in France. Um, and he was actually inspired by the rise of fact-checking in the US. Um, this blog was uh, um, a place for journalists, especially political journalists, to uh, try about fact-checking. And for five years, they wrote about 213 articles, mainly fact-checking political statements. So the, the decoders started really as a political fact-checking thing. Um, then over time, the blog gained popularity, and then it continued on March 2014 as a real online column on the Le Monde website. Um, it was created on 2014, and a team of six journalists was dedicated to it. The team has grown continuously then. Uh, since then, we are now 11 people working on Le Decoder. Le Decoder are based on three pillars. Uh, first, data journalism. Uh, we work and gather data to produce analysis, then fact-checking and hoax-busting. Um, we chase and debunk fake news spread by politicians or social networks, people on social networks or uh, disinformation websites, and then explaining journalism. We try to popularize stories as much as possible by giving keys to understanding to a large audience. On the places of science on Le Decoder, I counted approximately 150 articles talking about science, pure science, out of 3,912 articles published in three years and a half, uh, which represents about 3.5% of our articles. While it may seem low, but actually Le Decoder remains a general interest column, so we do write about every topic, almost every topic, from international stories to politics, society, society, culture, economics, etc. On the chart on the right, you can see the monthly number of science stories published uh, since the team was created. The blank on 2017 is due to the presidential campaign in France, which actually in campaigns, in electoral campaigns, Unfortunately, science has little, if no places at all, uh, in the public debates that are being held during the campaign. But uh, you, you can see, you can though notice that the, rise, the, the number is actually continuously rising since then. But at, at its very beginning, the science was quite absent um, to uh, what we wrote. 
This can be explained by the fact that sources of disinformation dramatically diversified in France since we launched the decoders. Um, and so did the nature of the fake news you can read online on the, on the French uh, internet. Uh, at the time the blog was running, the team was mainly focused on politicians, uh, fact-checking politi politician statements because they had no rivals in contributing, contributing to the public debate and they, were, they had quasi-monopoly on public speakings. So they were the main source of this information, I mean, on lies or misleading information. Uh, but since the rise of social networks like Twitter or uh, the multiplication of uh, alternative media as they call themselves or uh, amateur websites that are imitating journalistic standards, they has led to an ever increasing number of powerful vectors for fake news. Here are a few examples of fact-checking articles I've wrote for all the decoders. Apart from the third one, which deals with how politicians can try to deny climate change in order to gain a few votes, the major part of our science stories uh, deal with, deals with rumors and misleading scientific pieces of information that found to be popular online, like the safety of vaccines, for example, the first one which is a very polarized matter and is subject to many false or misleading scientific pieces of information online. Or hoaxes spread uh, by medias themselves, not very rigorous medias that use these kind of stories, clickbait stories. Like the one in the middle, uh, French medias claimed that a scientific study um, has concluded that uh, intelligence, cognitive uh, capabilities is genetically transmitted only by the mother, which was entirely false. They, was, they were based on a post, a, a post by a psychologist, a Spanish psychologist living in the US, and they didn't even mention it was only a post of blog and not a scientific study. Um, as for, the, that's the fact-checking part, as for the uh, explaining journalism, we think it's an important part of our job to explain how things work and how especially science work. Like, what's the protocol of the studies we quote? What are the results st statistically significant? What is the significance in statistics? Um, what are the other studies saying about it? These kind of things we think is very important to explain in order to uh, debunk all the uh, the cliché that are being that are that exist uh, about science, and I think it's very complementary on the fact-checking part. It's not only just telling what's wrong about things about what what is found on the internet. I think it's very complementary because it addresses two main problems. First, the distrust of sciences, which is provoked by little if no knowledge at all on how scientific knowledge is produced and how scientific method and uh, how scientists work and how studies are conducted. Actually, people have many cliches about that. Um, and second, the lack of critical thinking uh, of the readers, actually. Well, it may seem a bit rude, but actually we see many people distrust all the sciences and believe without questioning a story about this tropical flu that nobody talks about that cures cancer. I'm not joking. Uh, that's why we also try to popularize stories and make things and complicated matter uh, accessible to all with visualizations like maps, charts, or schemas, which, uh, which is, I think, is very important to uh, make things uh, very accessible. To finish, I'd like to talk about um, a tool we launched this year that's called the Decodex. The Decodex is a tool that we use to, to fight uh, fake news on the internet. It's a database that contains about a thousand websites that, are, uh, that have spread fake news or purposefully misleading news on the internet before. It's, uh, it's kind of an index, actually. Uh, it contains about a thousand websites and uh, it's available in three forms, three um, forms. So a search engine, 
uh, add-ons for folks and Chrome, Firefox and Chrome, and a chatbot on Facebook, which uh, answers to questions of readers. In this database, each, uh, each website has its de own description, and it's, uh, it's ranked among three categories, one of the three following categories, websites that are spread a significant number of fake news, don't mention any sources, and don't mention any information backing their claims, or websites that spread a significant number of misleading news, or satirical websites imitating real medias, which is misleading a greater number of people than we think, actually. Uh, and the search engine is meant to give an information about the websites, uh, including who created them and what are they spreading, and the references of fake news. Of course, we give any references about it. Uh, while the, uh, the add-on for browsers alerts people, like when you visit a website that is referenced in our database, we uh, actually warn people that it is indexed in the, da the database. There's a window on the upper right corner that inform people that it's actually known for sp spreading fake news. So um, the decodex isn't meant to uh, list, of course, every fake news on the internet, but it's uh, a tool that we intend to use to uh, bring fact-checking on a broader and larger scale uh, to fight against fake news. And it applies also on sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. So we will uh, continue now on our, our francophone theme uh, to another case study, this one from Canada. Our next speaker is Eve Baudin. She has been a journalist for 15 years. She started a career as a TV reporter specializing mostly in environmental issues for Radio Canada, Tele-Quebec, and TV5, among others. She was also a science columnist for numerous radio programs on Radio Canada Premier, where she focused mainly on debunking food and health myths. Uh, early 2017 marked Eve's debut at the news service Agence Science Presse uh, as the titular investigator at Detecteur de Rumeur. I'm really practicing my French pronunciation here, uh, which means rumor detector. Uh, she is also involved in media education projects. She gives lectures in high schools and colleges in hopes of helping students discern real from fake news. So here's Eve. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I did not organize this panel. This is the people from Montreal, so from Agence Science Presse, José Nadia and Pascal, which are the director and editor-in-chief of uh, Agence Science Presse. So uh, I just wanted to correct that. So uh, I would like to present you a bit about Agence Science Presse. So it's a francophone nonprofit press agency located in Montreal. It has been founded in 1978, so it's, all, uh, it's been there for almost 40 years now. And we are funded by one of Quebec's main research funds, so we are not depending on ads for a website, and we have no ads at all on our website. Um, we produce scientific articles, and we first publish them on our, I'm sorry, and we first publish them Okay, and we first published them on our website. Uh, so we have readers uh, throughout francophone countries like France. About half of our readers are there, and we are also read in uh, Belgium, Africa, and so on. Um, after the first, uh, as a press agency, of course, our, our articles are republished by different French-Canadian publications in Quebec. Uh, Ontario and Newfoundland, like CBC, which is Radio Canada in French, Huffington Post, MSN, Metro, and the other ones you don't know, maybe, but we reach a lot of people, people outside of our website. So, um, Detecteur de Rumeur is, uh, as you said, a rumor detector. Uh, it's, um, it's uh, I'm sorry, it's a fact-checking column. 
and I am the full-time uh, journalist working for this column. Uh, it's apparently the only known francophone fact-checking site dedicated exclusively to science. And my mandate is to debunk fake news, of course, uh, but in Quebec, I would say that it's not, uh, we don't have 100% uh, false information designed to deceive or do harm, which is the real uh, uh, signification of fake news. We don't, that, don't have that much of that because we're a really smart, small market and we speak French. So there's not a lot of money to make there with fake news. But we do have what I call a lot of junk information, so opinions presented as facts, misinformation, misleading use of information to frame an issue. Uh, we do have, of course, exaggeration, preconceived notions, and so on. So there's a lot of subjects, uh, and uh, since I'm the only one who works uh, as the fact checker there, uh, we have to ask ourselves one simple question if we want to treat a subject or not. First, uh, is, it, um, is, is this subject in uh, the media? Because if nobody talks about it, we don't want to put light on it first. So, and also we ask ourselves, can we debunk it with scientific facts? Uh, and as you probably know, most of the time the answer is yes, because science is really everywhere. So we have a huge, huge, huge playground, agriculture, environment, drugs, health issues, nutrition, uh, consumer goods, and so on. Uh, so there's lot, lots of work we can do. Um, the biggest challenge I have, <laughs> I would say as a joke, is you have to read the junk. So this is the kind of junk you have to read. Like bringing your child to the clinic for vaccination is uh, like bringing them to Auschwitz. So um, you have to also watch a lot of documentaries uh, like What the Health, because when you read about uh, this uh, documentary that was on Net Netflix and that says that uh, eating meat is as bad and it gives you cancer, like, is like smoking cigarette, you have to watch the movie. Uh, you also have to read magazines that maybe you would not read. Uh, magazines that says that cannabis can cure cancer. And, um, and stuff like this also, like flat earthers. Uh, so, I mean, it's sometimes it's fun, but sometimes it's also alarming to see that there are still flat earthers in 2017. But the truth is, yes, and you have to be aware of that. So uh, I think Brooks said you have, to, you, read, you have to read a lot of broad media, and I think it's true. Um, so uh, dum, 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 dum. it is very, very labor intensive uh, because you really need to understand the junk, as I said. You have to review the arguments being made in the original articles because they, they, sometimes it's just opinions. But sometimes uh, they bring something to the table, they use pseudosciences, or they bring uh, science, real science, but they misuse it, they deform it. So you have to read it, you have to understand, and then you have to debunk it with scientific fact, explain why they're wrong in their article or uh, documentary and so on, and why uh, this science is misused, and then you have to explain what science really says and inform and educate. So it's a really, really long process, I would say. Uh, longer, I'm sure, than coming up with a fake news in a basement in Macedonia. So <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, I would say that it takes at least three days uh, to do the research and write, and this is uh, an understatement uh, for an average of 7,000 characters. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of work. Um, at the beginning, we used to do mostly truth or false text with a barometer. Apparently, 80% of uh, the fact-checking sites uh, use that kind of thing. Uh, so we would say, is it true that eating meat is as bad for health uh, that's, that smoking? Is it true that cannabis can cure cancer? And then we would say it's wrong or uh, is it wrong or, or, or true? So uh, as you probably know, um, 
health and food is very popular. And when we do that kind of text, we write about the origin of the rumor, as I said, uh, we say why it's wrong, we explain the sciences, and we finish with a verdict. So we chose not to put any highlights, any links leading to the false information. We talk about it in the text, we say, we, we say what they, they say, but we don't put that much emphasis on this because we want, and then we have to explain how we found the information. This is really important as a fact checker to explain how you found the real good scientific information be because you need to educate people and tell them how to find it and where to find it. And so we put lots of links to the validated scientific data we use to justify our conclusion. Um, and then we also started to do also lots of explanatory journalism, uh, not as sophisticated as Le Monde, unfortunately, uh, but uh, those articles are interesting because uh, we can say, okay, things to know about uh, marijuana and dependency, GMOs in food, flooding, flooding climate change, so people can make a better idea of uh, complex subjects. So, and we have also a small toolbox that uh, we're trying to elaborate more uh, to explain to our reader how to make the difference between fake information and science-based information and so on. Um, and I also started to do a once a month interview with a specialist who debunks one myth, uh, like this one is natural sugars are not better than refined sugars for health and it proved to be, proved to be very, very popular uh, column. So uh, that's it. <laughs> um, the thing we didn't plan is that we are not now engaged in lots of media literacy programs. We got calls from schools, high schools and colleges. Uh, they wanted us to teach media literacy to children, teens, young adults help them uh, self-check the information they are exposed to, develop a critical mind, uh, help them uh, to ask themselves some question. Who is behind the information? What is the evidence? What do the sources say? And making them also aware of their biases be because people share uh, the information because of their biases, of course. So you have to explain that also. Um, and we are presently putting together a short training on fake news in Quebec with the Quebec, uh, uh, Quebec Journalist Federation. Uh, we, we're pairing journalism, uh, journalists around Quebec with schools and we can present them, we can go in the school and present uh, how to do that. So it's pretty interesting, it's called 30 seconds before you believe because we really think that just waiting 30 seconds before you push on the button and, 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 and push like and, and, and share can make a difference. So that's why we chose that. Um, is it worth it? Is, it, is fact checking worth it? Yes. Uh, the rumor detector uh, um, texts are three times more read than our other articles. 80% of them are republished. They engage a lot of discussion on social media. They gave us a lot of uh, visibility, new readers. We made new partnership with magazines with that. And in the bigger scheme, it's also worth it because we really believe that putting good information out there is important to fight fake news because as you probably know there are studies showing that good scientific articles can be used by readers to convince their peers uh, during debates on social media. So even if we don't reach uh, directly the people who believe in the fake news in the beginning, uh, our articles can be used by people and that is interesting, I think. Um, of course, war on fake news will not be won solely by fact-checking journalists. This is just a joke because I think sometimes we like uh, this guy in black and white with our typers while the um, people spreading fake news, well, they have the biggest scoop because they invent it. And they play with the emotion of people, of course. And that's why they are so shared. And so I don't think 
we can alone win this war because it's a very complex problem. Um, journalists, of course, need to be better funded. Governments need to act because maybe like Germany did, um, technology needs to be adapted. I know that bots now can spot fake news eclosion, so that maybe that can help us. Uh, and scientists will need to have a better understanding of the dissemination mechanism and cognitive biases be behind the spreading of the fake news. Um, and finally, I would say Facebook and Google will need to do something more than uh, the disrupted by the third party fact checkers because it's not enough. Uh, they need to do something about the feed rankings of these news, maybe find a way to promote good information, put credibility first, and all of this is needed to promote good information and help people choose accurate news over falsehood. That's it. I'm, I'm glad Eb brought up Facebook. Let's be sure to talk about that later. Uh, our last speaker is, excuse me, is uh, Alex Kasprak. He is a science writer and a journalist whose work has been featured in the Atlantic, Motherboard, New Scientist, and other venues. Uh, he's at Snopes now. Before joining Snopes, he was a staff science writer at BuzzFeed and a science communicator at NASA JPL here in California. He has a master's degree in geology from Brown and a science writing degree from Johns Hopkins. And he's going to talk about Snopes, uh, a site that uh, is based here in California but has worldwide reach. So here's Alex. Uh, so yeah, I'm Alex. I'm the one and only science writer for Snopes. Um, and I'm just going to be talking a little bit about some of the uh, things that we're seeing in terms of science, uh, the way we've been handling it, this sort of increase in scientific misinformation, uh, the challenges we face, and maybe some ways forward as well. Uh, just a quick overview of Snopes itself. There's uh, 12 of us on the editorial side of things. We've got a seven-person operations team. We work all over the country uh, remotely. We were founded in 1995, which is before uh, social media, Google, all that stuff. Things have changed on the internet th since then a little bit, uh, but we're still going, going strong. We're uh, part of the uh, Facebook fact-checking efforts, uh, and we're a signatory to the uh, pointer fact-checking uh, code of principles as well. So if you've only kind of heard of Snopes, you've probably run into it with, with stories kind of like this. Uh, this is, I think, our most popular post of all time, uh, which is ridiculous. Uh, this thing keeps on coming up, people posting warnings uh, saying, you know, Facebook's going to make this public. Here is a dubious legal argument that you can post to prevent that from happening. Um, so that's the type of like basic sort of internet misinformation that has always uh, been popular at Snopes. Um, also, kind of urban legends. This is the notion that if you enter your PIN code into an ATM in reverse, it'll call the authorities to save you from trouble. It, it, like on its face, it doesn't make a lot of sense because like if you have a palindrome kind of <laughs> ATM code is, I don't know what the cops are going to do in that situation. Um, but this is another popular one and sort of typical of the more urban legendy stuff that we do. But we also do science. Um, and we, we handle it in a number of ways. We do it with fact checking, uh, we do it with explainers, um, and, and sometimes uh, deeper investigations as well. So here's one example. Um, I guess earlier in February, Daily Mail uh, wrote this ridiculous like expose uh, claiming that NOAA scientists had manipulated data to get rid of the pause in, uh, the, the pause in uh, recent warming. Uh, the story itself was later forced to issue a correction on it. Uh, it was wrong. It misused science, it misattributed quotes. Um, so what we did with that, we didn't do a fact check. We did a very detailed story about 
what happened, what the original reporting was, how the world, words were twisted, and you know, sort of what the reality uh, was behind that story. So that's one approach. We do a lot of uh, vaccine stuff as well. This is uh, an example of that, also an explainer story. Uh, this was the Mawson et al. 2017 version uh, of a study claiming a, a link between vaccines and everything else that's bad. It was a terrible study. Uh, it, was just, it was retracted once and then resubmitted. Uh, so even the first ever side of things is questionable. But uh, we deal with that kind of thing as well a fair amount. Also, some of the sillier stuff, like this claim from uh, David Avocado Wolf. I don't know if you're familiar with his memes on the internet. So, very, pop, very popular internet guru, but he, he was arguing that you put onions on your foot. It's, uh, I think it like detoxes you or something. It doesn't. Uh, so you know, just like a quick search of the uh, internet proves that. But the way we would handle this is not say, oh, this is stupid, uh, which it is, but it's, it's more to be like, this is, these are the three-point arguments that David Wolf is making, and each one of them is factually wrong for these egregious reasons. So that's sort of how we do that. We also do just like lazy science reporting. Uh, this was two weeks ago, maybe. Uh, New York Times reported on a, a conference presentation accurately about uh, research uh, in the uh, Yellowstone caldera. Uh, USA Today and Fox News then took one sentence from the New York Times reporting and turned it into uh, humanity was, was doomed, went super viral, and in no way did the research say anything close to that. Uh, so that's a basic fact check about where, you know, I, I called the researcher up, I was like, so, how do you feel about this coverage? <laughs> and she, she was like, oh, it's terrible. Uh, I'm so glad you called, you know. But that's pretty straightforward. You're like, what did the actual presentation say? Okay, that sounds nothing like what USA Today said. So um, that's another type of thing we do. Uh, as I mentioned before, we also sometimes do like much deeper investigations. This is a piece that I did. It took like six months to research, and it's a fascinating story about this retired scientist uh, who claims to have created a cure for cancer. Actually, it's been up to this way. It's a cure for cancer and herpes and schizophrenia at the moment. Uh, it's not, obviously, but um, he had his papers retracted uh, three years ago, and that created this whole internet conspiracy where the government is hiding a cure for cancer. So I sort of looked into, like, well, you know, what happened to this guy who's had a long and storied legitimate scientific career? And I just, I, you know, I documented the retirement years where he came up with a completely manufactured research institute out of his house that labeled, like, his son and other people as members. And people, like, I contacted these people on task forums. They had no idea they were listed. So it was, it was a wild tale, and that would, we do that from time to time if we have time. Um, one sort of case study from this very week, uh, and this is from Breitbart. This is the second time they've sort of pulled this type of story by James Dellingpole, uh, which is basically like 400 scientific papers in 2017 saying global warming is a myth. It's not true. Um, none of them say that. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've worked with James Dellingbull's work in the past. He's like Breitbart's prolific climate denier. And this time I, I thought like maybe I'd just ask him like what his process was for researching this story. Um, so, I, you know, I said, how long did it take to research this piece? And, and he told me as little time as I possible. <laughs> and like, <laughs> I thought, I was like, oh, we got him, you know? <laughs> uh, but no, this was actually uh, a, a thing that James was proud of. Um, very, I mean, you can, so then, uh, it was my dick question, I guess, I was like, did you read all, or, you know, or a fraction of these 400 studies, or talk to any of the scientists? And you know, I was skeptical because this whole story is based off like a climate skeptic blog post that came out like less than 24 hours before this Breitbart piece. So I was like, it's like a lot of time to read 400 papers. Um, so he was like, I just suppose I could have spent days, weeks reading all the papers and then more weeks ringing up the scientists, you know, but I didn't, because that would have been utterly dumb and pointless. Um, I mean, there it is. That's 
And this, <laughs> and I know these responses. They weren't responses to an email. Uh, they were published in a story with this title. Um, <laughs> And, uh, the weird, like the weird thing is with this, is that uh, the story w was published before I wrote my fact check. He just, he, I think he he thought my email with three questions was the fact check. Uh, yeah, I'm an impertinent pup. Which, I, if anyone knows if that's a reference from something, I'd be interested. No, I haven't figured it out. But uh, this post here has more shares than the uh, fact check we put on it, which, and, and the fact check's doing fine, but like people think this argument that Dylan Cole made about not reading it and being proud of it, people loved that. People were coming into my mentions on Twitter being like, oh man, Dylan Cole really did you this time. I was like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So we're living in these, <laughs> these two different worlds, and, and in my view, like there's a, a part of the internet world right here that, um, likely can't be reached by Snopes.com, uh, but I think it's important to cover still because you can use this as an example, and that's what we did uh, in my debunker of it, um, of the methods that would be used. So it's pretty simple, you know, this was just a collection of papers that were either completely misinterpreted, like to a laughable degree, or were like not pu were published on a website somewhere, not a journal. One of them was uh, was peer reviewed. It went through uh, two and a half days of peer review according to the time <laughs> timeline, which is not. I don't think that sounds like peer review to me, but who knows? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's just kind of an overview of the challenges that we deal with, some of the strategies that we employ at Snopes, and that's my information. Well, there's a lot to chew on with those four uh, presentations, and we, we will have time for questions, so if people want to start uh, lining up at the main mic there, please do. In the meantime, I'll take the moderator's privilege and ask the first question, and, and that is, it, it seems like with these fact-checking sites, one of the reasons they're so popular is because there is something very emotionally satisfying about calling BS on somebody, you know, and saying, you're wrong. But there's also a difficulty with that. It's an old difficulty in journalism, and that is that, you know, it's a, the sort of a hero and villain trope sometimes doesn't actually reflect the reality. And uh, oftentimes it's, it's not a binary choice, true or false. And, and people have figured out different ways of dealing with the shades of, of meaning. But I wonder if anyone agrees with me that as useful as these fact-checking sites are, they do sort of encourage a black and white view of the world that doesn't necessarily reflect a weight of the evidence kind of view that's science. And so how, how do you deal with that problem? Does anybody want to tackle that? Okay. Uh, I mean, that, yeah, it's a hard one because uh, to a certain extent, a lot of the questions, especially in science you deal with, framing them as a true or false is in itself sort of misleading sometimes. Which is why for things like, you know, a bad research paper coming out that's claiming a link between vaccines and autism or something, I'd avoid doing a false because anybody who, who might believe the original stories would be like, false, discard, this is a lie or whatever. But and that's why I think science, compared to a lot of the other things, has these longer explainer pieces that I do that kind of just explain the controversy. Uh, and my hope, and I don't know if it's working, is that people can use that as a tool to, to talk to other people about it. But I would say the same. This is our experience also. We started with truth or false, and uh, then we decided to do more explanatory journalism. And, uh, and I think it's a lot in the tone, in the way you explain. Uh, you just want to talk to people and not, um, um, I don't know, have an attitude about, you are wrong about believing that. Uh, so you just need to explain the facts and why they were wrong. And I think um, it's, if you do it right, you're not 
polarizing more the subject because you're putting good information out there. And as I said, there are studies proving that that can be used and efficiently in debates. So, um, so that's why I believe that it's not always polarizing. I think it can be used against polarization and it can be used also to open up the discussion. So you have to write it in this frame of mind. This is what I think. Well, um, this is something we, we've done before, like uh, maybe um, on some articles we wrote, uh, we, we actually did uh, maybe insist too much on why it's true or why it's false. And actually that's something we don't, we, we don't do anymore for a long time, uh, because every time you, you, you are insisting on that too much, uh, people are reacting very strongly, and that's not very constructive. That's something that uh, it's, it goes the wrong way, because Readers don't like that. They don't. They don't like being treated th that way. And actually, that's something we we have softened uh, um, on um, when the blog was running. And and after that, uh, it was maturating. And now we are more um, the titles and the the way we write. It's more like why it's misleading, why it's maybe partly false, why it may be right, but not true or false anymore. That's something we we've done a couple of times before, but. That's quite rare now, yeah. It, uh, it kind of occurs to me, I wonder, I mean, I think explainers are really helpful and I think fact checking is really helpful, but it, uh, listening to everyone speak and seeing everyone's presentation does make me think of the idea of the deficit model, which for a long time we thought was the proper way to do science communication. And we know now that there's a lot of research suggesting that that doesn't actually work. The idea was give people more information and then they'll understand science more and they'll understand the world more and they won't believe myths and, and fake news. So I don't really know the answer to that, but I do think everyone should be thinking about that in the room as they're thinking about fact checking and explainers and that sort of stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I can tell you with my own, my own experience, I've always done better when I've taken the time to actually explain a little bit about weight of the evidence and not be afraid to use words like we don't know for sure or at this point, the best information is that it, it's okay to, to, to qualify things. Uh, and I, I think sometimes we're too quick to give in to the uh, unimpeachable declaration when, especially in science, everything can be, can be questioned and needs to be questioned. Uh, yeah, Peter. Um, I th thank you for your presentations and, and for the work you're doing and, and all the different creative tools that, and approaches that you're exploring and, and building. Um, I, was, I was struck by your, um, sorry, your, the Snopes uh, writer's comment that uh, Del Delling Poll's, you know, re rebuttal got, you know, more hits than, than uh, what you had done. And um, it seems, uh, you know, I, I'm guessing that all of you, to some extent, all of us are preaching to the choir, right? We're, we're, we're not reaching the people who really need more help um, understanding reality today. And I'm wondering, is, is there a role, for example, I mean, Delling Poll is using sort of humor, I think, um, uh, and, and a more casual kind of approach. Is there an opportunity to use humor from the fact-checking side? Um, uh, for example, uh, you know, a, a, a Delling Pole cartoon um, where he's like a superhero for misinformation and, you know, you're sort of showing him, showing his methodology. Can we do that? Um, can we do, you know, be more creative and, and funny and still retain our credibility? Alex? Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I think it has to be more subtle than a Delling Pole cartoon, perhaps. But as my, I would love to see such a cartoon, though. Um, at least for me, I inject, depending on this sort of tone of the topic uh, or the level of inaccuracy, um, like I have a sense sometimes, especially when taking down Dylan Paul, that I am speaking to the choir. So w what I try and do is I make the fact check as entertaining as possible. I, you know, I'll make a snarky comment here or there. The version that was published is much less snarky than what I submitted, but uh, it's still got you know uh, some good nuggets. I think that's helpful 
And the way I judge sort of that kind of thing is when I see on Facebook people sharing like, yo, Bill, remember that thing you shared yesterday? You know, so wrong because of this. And like, I don't know if Bill is gonna change his mind, but at least it got to Bill. And I think that's what you have to do. You make it a popular enough read within the community that you're in and then maybe you know, Bill or whatever will read it at least. I do think that you know one thing to learn from the social science research is that it is poss it, 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 it depends on you know how culturally freighted the issue is. But if it, if the issue is relatively unknown, it and it's not sort of closely identified with with you know a particular tribe or a group of tribes, then it, it is possible to actually get people to to change their views based on the evidence. But it's for the, for the for many of the issues that we care the most about, it's it's quite difficult. I'm sure everyone remembers, you know, what a, to, to Peter's point, one of the most effective ways of making the point about uh, 99 plus percent of climate scientists was when John Oliver had uh, anyone remember this? Maybe five to ten years ago, you know, asked a hundred scientists to stand on one corner and then one person to stand on the other side, and it was it was pretty effective and and it used both a visual cue and humor. Um, so I just finished a, a master's thesis that sort of addressed uh, fake news in the most recent wave and how it affects people's perceptions of science. And you guys all touched on the very nuanced, complex contributing factors that divide people into these camps. But I'm wondering how much you see advertising, and in particular native advertising, that kind of blurs the line between agenda and content as contributing to people's willingness to consume information that may not be well supported. Anybody have, have anything to say about na native ads? Right. Well, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure how common this is in in you know outside of the U.S. But increasingly in the U.S., media companies are relying on native ads, which are which are not really produced by editorial staff, or at least hopefully not. But they're designed to look a lot like journalism. So. To, to some skeptics and critics, at the same time we're deploring fake news, we're profiting from not exactly fake news, but, but some, some deception. Anybody have anything to say about that? Um, I'd say just more broadly that media, and again that's this monolith that's not totally fair to use, but all of, everyone in media sort of has contributed to the ecosystem that allows fake news to thrive, and I think that native ad advertising is one of those things. I think that you know, clickbait and getting facts wrong and doing infotainment rather than actually informative news on nightly news shows and that kind of stuff. I think all of that has contributed to misinformation being spread more easily because people are sort of primed to be able to spread that. And also it makes it more difficult for readers to differentiate between real news and ads and total made up stuff. I go and meet um, the, the kids and the teens and the young, young adults, they usually talk about that and they say that that kind of content um, and clickbait and so on make them lose their confidence in the medias. So that's a good point. Uh, I didn't work, uh, I didn't do any papers on that, but uh, I'm sure, as said Brooke, that it's uh, leading to people having less faith in medias in, in general. I would, I would say, in my experience, like a lot of the health uh, stories that come out there, uh, you know, coconut oil is great, coconut oil is going to kill you, that kind of thing. All of, I mean, they're always selling whatever it is they're talking about. It's not always overt, but like you take a couple of links, it's like, oh man, this is convenient, I just read this great article on this product and now I can buy it. And that's how most of the sort of fringe pseudoscience health websites operate. Uh, you know, natural news is all supplement selling, uh, similar with uh, Infowars and all of that. So they, it, and they wouldn't even, I, I think, suggest that that's like uh, branded advertising, whatever, branded content. But I think it's a huge problem and I think that's one of, I think we need in some way to come up with a more obvious way to disclose when something is written with the purpose of selling you something. But that's one of many issues out there. 
like so much else in journalism, it's, it's rooted in this fundamental problem of lack of revenue. We, we all want to do journalism, and we don't have enough revenue to, to support the journalism that we want to do. And that leads to a, a, a lot of sort of shading, and native ads are certainly part of that. Uh, who's next? Hi, thanks for the panel. Um, I have a question for Brooke, which is, when you're fact-checking an op-ed, um, what are the, where you, the author is very, very invested um, and not always correct, um, what do you, uh, how do you, what tactics might apply especially, and I'm thinking particularly where somebody might, you ask them for some annotation, they ask for, they supply a peer-reviewed article by them and you know or suspect that there's other stuff that says something quite different. Sure, I, I personally don't have a lot of experience fact-checking op-eds, but I've interviewed a bunch of fact-checkers who have done that sort of work or fact-checking reviews and these sorts of things and there's opinion in there, right? So you're not really, fa you can't really fact-check their opinion because their opinion is their opinion and you're just assuming that that's what they're stating is how they feel. But going through and fact-checking the sources that they're using to build that and making sure there aren't red flags, if someone's citing themselves, um, maybe encouraging them to add some other sources in there, you might, I mean, you might not win on that one because they're trying to build their argument and they have the space to do that in an op-ed. Uh, that also is why we flag things as op-eds and editorials, right? Because it's, it's pointing out that there's an opinion in there and it's not straight news and there's, you know, a slant and a bias. It's part of what the purpose is of that sort of space. Um, so I think really as long as you're fact-checking that the facts that they're building their argument from are accurate and yeah, there, there might be a lot more errors of omission in that kind of writing than there are in others, but I think, the re I think readers do know that that's the purpose of an op-ed and they're not necessarily expecting a straight news full story in that kind of context. Gary, does, does Le Mans fact check? Uh, do you, do you fact check if, if Sarkozy uh, offers his opinion about something or, or it's not Sarkozy anymore, but you know, if a politician, uh, do you, uh, how do you handle opinion in, in Le Mans when you're trying to sort of do true or false? Well, we fact-checked a lot of politicians before, and actually, uh, it's getting harder because um, um, because of the rise of fact-checking. Um, politicians do not actually tell us, um, like, it, ha it always happens, but they aren't um, as uh, strict anymore. Like, they are trying to avoid these kind of traps because, like, they, they are... Uh, if they are emitting only purely opinions, we can't fact check anything. If they are telling, if they are not telling any facts in their opinion, we don't fact check. And actually, that's uh, that's kind of a, a trend in um, in the political life in France. Uh, we do observe more uh, more and more politicians trying to avoid uh, to be fact checked, and so they are sometimes telling pure opinions based on. E anything or sometimes they do um, tell facts that are ant based on anything and they are telling about a report that tells something but it, it does not exist actually so they try to to sometimes be smart and give sources that doesn't exist but we can't prove it the contrary because they are they will still be saying that there's a report saying that and actually it doesn't exist and they are still um, they will they have a position that is quite um, Difficult to debunk. Yeah, that, there's also the the word salad approach, which our president of the United States is, is pretty good at. You know, the well, I, I've heard everyone is saying, or or even sort of contradicting yourself, you know, within a single sentence or paragraph. Where then, if if the one thing you said, you know, is obviously wrong, you could say, oh, but look, I actually said the opposite. You know, one sentence later, and yet you're still able to communicate your your message to your base. So it, it, it does get really difficult. Just what, one other thing, I, I've written a couple of op-eds recently for the Times and I was impressed and intimidated to the extent that they did aggressively fact check opinion pieces and it, it definitely makes your piece better when they, when they press you to say, well, on what basis are you, are you drawing this conclusion? Shan. Hi, I am Shannon Hall, and I reported the Times story that was misinterpreted, and Snopes immediately jumped on. Thank you, Alex. Um, 
So the lead researcher was very concerned that it would be misinterpreted. And we worked very hard to get the facts right as we would any time, but also you know, say that Yellowstone was not going to erupt anytime soon. And it was obviously still misinterpreted. So I guess I'm curious in reporting a story that you know might blow out of proportion, you know, what else can you really do to, to get a head start on that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a hard question. Anybody, anyone want to take that? I mean, I guess Sh Shannon's really asking, as a, not as a fact checker, but more as a as the initial purveyor of the news, how do you prepare yourself to be misinterpreted? How do you, how mean, do you prepare your story? How do you make your story sort of, you know, more, more, less prone to misinterpretation? Is it even possible? I think it's possible. Um, I think you have to look at every sentence you write, pull it out and pretend it's the headline of your story and uh, see how that would go over in terms of accuracy. So I could not, uh, I just made that approach up now, so I don't know if that, <laughs> But I will say, uh, I think it was pretty much one sentence from your piece that was the one that linked it. It was the, the, the human time scale or whatever. And that was referring, of, of course, to the time scale of the process that would theoretically occur before an eruption, not the probability of an eruption. And it, it really, it, you know, the whole thing that everyone else reported relied on that one sentence. I don't know if there's a way we can figure out what those sentences are gonna be. Like I think with Yellowstone, that's always going to be a topic that gets all the clicks. So you, I think if it's a topic in the past that's been frequently rep misrepresented, which Yellowstone has, um, I don't know, go in and see what uh, frames of that story have been viral in the past and then make it clear that that's not the story you're writing. But I don't know, it's hard because you can try as hard as you want and it'll still get misinterpreted. Anybody else have tips on that? Um, actually, they're all tools to do more, like like Alex said um, before, um, and we all observed that. Um, when you do fact check something, it is likely to be less visible, much more less visible than the original lie, actually, that, that's being spread on the internet. But there are tools like, uh, at the moment, we are working with Google, uh, actually, to being visible, uh, like if there's a fake news spreading uh, and we do an article about it. We work on, with Google for uh, to to be visible on the first research. Like many people, they do research on search engine, and and if they type the the, the, the keywords that are being that leads to the, the the story, actually there will be um, if we if we do write an article about it, there will be on the first result um, uh, a little uh, thing that that says that Le Monde says it's false or Le Monde says it's misleading. So that's, that's one of the tools we are trying to promote and develop to, um, to being more visible um, in the fight against fake news. That's, uh, I think that's uh, a key tool to, to fight against it because most people uh, are Googling things. Yeah, and r rapid reaction is really important too. Uh, to, you know, when, when you see the story being misinterpreted, you know, react on Twitter, tweet to the reporter, you know, and I know, Shannon, you did this, uh, and that, that it, it doesn't stop the virality, but there's a kind of a shaming factor that, that can be helpful sometimes. Uh, and it, it, uh, it's better than not reacting, let's put it that way. So I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, we're out of time. In fact, we're over time. But our last questioner, if, if you want to ask your question, uh, come on up to the front. I'm sure people will, our, our panelists will hang out for a few minutes. And everyone else, it's, uh, it's lunchtime. So thank you very much. <laughs>